Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So thankful that you've brought us this far. So thankful that you are faithful. So thankful for your love and your grace, your mercy. So thankful for opening our eyes to see the, the wonders of your grace. I just ask that you would filter out all of that which is not of you. All of that which is foolish, but just seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're getting ready to step into our new study of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. And uh, there's no way to adequately describe a grace of God that's so encompassing that it covers uh, a host of Christians who not only fail to comprehend it, but who vehemently oftentimes argue against it. I could say right here from the outset, as many of you probably already know, that the church at Corinth was a mess. But suppose that we came into this study without that understanding. And we just found that out as we, as we went along. And we didn't prejudice our thoughts right from the start with what we know to be the absolute truth of the matter. The church at Corinth was involved in unspeakable uh, uh, what I would call uh, almost uh, unspeakable atrocities against the very nature and the very character of the Christian life in the church. That's one thing I want to point out before we begin this new study. And it's always exciting to, be, to begin a new study. I'll be studying right along with you folks. Uh, those of you who have determined to do so, you'll be studying right along with me. And, and I'm going to try to do something a little different than I've done in the past concerning all of the verse by verse studies that we've done. Uh, one has to do with the, the way that you go about study, studying uh, these verses, studying verse by verse. Or how that you go about study in general um, I think it might be helpful for uh, some of you folks that who are really sincere about what we're doing here and our purpose uh, in all this to understand just how we uh, arrive at some of our conclusions the, some of the conclusions that we make how how we actually go about study uh, a lot of this is going to be that I'll be presenting will be based on uh, much of my formal formal training in the past, in the years past, I think it's important because uh, it's it's one thing just to listen to my opinion and and, and not uh, uh, at least try to make some attempt at reaching your own conclusions and not, therefore, you don't believe something just because I believe it. So that's one thing I want to point out from the very uh, outset here. I uh, just got through doing a couple of videos on what I believe is is uh, gives us hope for 2022, uh, the, uh, the rapture, and and I hope that uh, you found those beneficial. I hope that that uh, that you will allow all of that to weigh into what you already uh, believe uh, uh, to be true, and 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 that it will continue to give us give you hope. Uh, so I want to say something really quickly about that. This, uh, many of you are familiar with the Great Reset. Uh, if, you, if you're not, you might Google the term and, and look at that, the, at least uh, Google's definition of that. The, now I'm not talking about socialism. I'm not talking about communism. Uh, but the Great Reset, which is occurring throughout uh, uh, 
well, most Western co countries for sure, but many Eastern countries as well, uh, including Israel. And that's my point here. So it's no surprise that the unbelieving uh, Israel uh, goes against Orthodox Judaism and enters into a covenant of death and hell with the Antichrist during Daniel's 70th week. Uh, this revolution uh, toward change. And then this is what I find really remarkable. And this is something I want you to, to just take note of. Uh, this revolution toward change that we see happening here in the USA uh, and other Western nations as well, so, you know, such as Australia and, and other nations, I believe is God's handwriting on the wall concerning unbelieving Israel, turn, turning against the foundational, traditional principles of its founding fathers. And I say that based upon the fact that our uh, this revolution that we see really taking place within or our own country here of the United States is is exactly just is just exactly that it's a turning turning against away from turning away from the, the foundational traditional principles of our founding fathers and when and when we look at this on a global scale we see that that same thing is happening everywhere and so I think uh, that's worthy of taking note of because uh, it's uh, precisely what the angel Gabriel uh, spoke to Daniel about uh, and how that uh, a portion of Israel, uh, non-believing Israel, uh, would actually make, whereas, whereas uh, a part of Israel will, will enter into a covenant of death and hell with the Antichrist, uh, believing Israel uh, will not and the the remnant uh, that God preserves and protects during that pe that period they will not do that uh, as the unbelieving segment of Israel will and I just think it's a there's a I don't know a parallel there you know between what we see t occurring here in the U.S. and what we see occurring in, in Israel. The same thing has to be happening there. It's a generational thing. And uh, we are living through one of what I believe is one of the most uh, 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 interesting uh, periods in uh, human history. I do believe that the uh, dispensation of grace is, is rapidly coming to an end. But uh, that that aside, that, that said, uh, let's continue on in, in our study, uh, or let's begin our study here in 1 Corinthians. We're gonna step into this uh, really gingerly, really lightly. Um, we're not gonna get in any hurry to uh, in, in kicking this thing off. There's a few things I want to say before we actually get started. One has to do with what uh, we call the analogy of faith. Now, basically what that means is it's, it's interpreting a verse or a passage uh, uh, of scripture in light of the whole. It's, it's avoiding contradictions. At the time of the Reformation, to stop these, all of these creepy interpretations of scripture, the reformers set forth the uh, what they call the analogy of faith, which basically means that scripture is its own interpreter. In other words, uh, uh, is a particular verse or passage in scripture, is it consistent with the overall teaching of the Bible? Just think of it as pieces of a larger puzzle. Uh, you know, behind and behind the principle of the analogy of faith is the absolute confidence, the absolute confidence that the Bible is indeed the inspired word of God, because if it is, it must be consistent and there can't be any contradictions. And one of the problems that we see today among Christian Bible students is, 
is, is that they will adopt into, incorporate into their personal theology, uh, their belief system, a certain set of uh, principles or beliefs that are inconsistent with the whole of Scripture. So we need to be careful as we study this book. I've pointed this out before, how that we are dealing with the uh, infinite, uh, almighty, majestic Word of God. And so we need to, to, to think about that as we go forward. Now, I, I want to just sort of at least make some effort to try to take you through the process that I go through as I uh, begin a, a study or as I, as I study through uh, Scripture. This is not some uh, set in stone process. This is the way that I do it. Uh, may not be the way that you do it. May, may not be the way that you go about it. And that's fine. Uh, maybe this will help some people. Maybe it won't. If you're comfortable with the way that you go through and, and study scripture, if, that's, you, if the method that you use is something that you're comfortable with, then I, I wouldn't by any means try to, to, to move you away from that. I just thought it might be helpful if I did that for once. I've never done that through all of the verse by verse studies that we've done. I've never actually uh, taken the time to try to explain how I reach some of the conclusions that I do. So I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you that to start off with here, uh, uh, and it may not be uh, you may not see this as is really in in the right order of everything. You know, we, we need to look at the background of Corinth. Uh, but before we do, let's just begin with verse 1. And, uh, and let's read through uh, just a simple read of Scripture. Now, we're told to study, to show ourselves approved, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. It doesn't say, uh, the text does not say to, to read, to study to show yourself approved. It says to study, to show yourselves approved. So there's a difference between reading and, and studying, and both are vital. Both are vitally important. Uh, studying doesn't replace reading. Reading certainly doesn't replace studying. They work in, uh, in, uh, in tandem with one another. I just think it's important that we read as well as study. And so, so what we're going to do first is just to get the feel for the overall, uh, maybe the, the, what the text is saying here. We're going to read through uh, a number of verses. I'll, I've chosen a number of verses here. We're going to read through these. And uh, at least we'll have that as some uh, jump off uh, point, a beginning point, where that we can move on from, from, the, from there. So let's read through. Uh, a few verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes our brother unto the church of God which is at Corinth to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus called to be saints with all that it, in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord both theirs and ours. Grace be unto you in peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you'll notice, even in the King James Version, which is the version I'm primarily looking at here, uh, you won't see the words to be in verse 1, and you won't see the word uh, uh, to be in verse 2. Uh, you, it should be italicized in the authorized version, which means it doesn't appear in the original text. Uh, so the text would literally read, Paul called an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called saints. Not called to be saints, but called saints. With all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as I, I mentioned previously, uh, if we come to, to the beginning of this and we begin reading and begin studying 1 Corinthians with the thought or the knowledge in mind that the, the Corinthians were a total train wreck, uh, moral, morally speaking, 
uh, that their lives were just a mess. Uh, we would see right here in, the, in just the, the, the first uh, opening three verses of the first chapter of First Corinthians that uh, it, this might perhaps not be exactly what we, you and I, would have written to the church at Corinth. In fact, I think it's uh, a safe to say, I don't think we're uh, stepping out of bounds here to say or to suggest, it wouldn't be wrong for me to suggest that many Christians today, uh, that's, this is not the letter that they would have written to these awful Corinthians. Now, having made that point, uh, which uh, maybe I sh maybe that was good. It's good that I make that point. Maybe it's not so good that that I make that point. It, it as I said, it it sort of prejudices our thinking right from the outset. This is not something that we're typically that we're supposed to know or to learn or to come to understand until after we've studied the, the or, or at least read the uh, the epistle you know, of first Corinthians. It's only then after reading it that we come to understand this. Now, we, because of the help of the commentators and because of the help of, of so many others who have gone before us, we, we can approach the text with the understanding that the church was a mess. And I just think that that's wonderful. Uh, it kind of goes along with, uh, with what I read before. That I'd written and posted to Facebook. It's uh, there's no, no there's no really adequate way to to describe such a grace of God as this. We tend to throw the word grace around as if it really means something other than what it what it means. God's grace is so overwhelming, so encompassing, so real, and so dynamic that it, it covers even those Christians who don't fail to comprehend it, but who vehemently argue, sometimes even argue against it. And so what the Corinthians needed from God, the Holy Spirit, and I want you to keep in mind that he's the author, Paul just merely held the pen. Uh, I think that the message that the Holy Spirit is intending to convey here to, the, to his people uh, at, at Corinth and, and keep in mind it's to the church of God at Corinth and I don't necessarily believe that that is limited to a single church I think that it's to when, when God the Holy Spirit is speaking to his people at Corinth the church of God because the church is an organism a living organism it's not a brick and mortar structure or it's not a you know a, a a uh, hone on out of rock synagogue with pillars. It's not. It's not necessarily a building uh, made by hands, but it's a building made by God. I'm willing to suggest that we need to probably think of how that there may have been several churches there in Corinth, which who shared this letter uh, that Paul had written to the church that he initially had visited previously on a missionary journey and uh, had uh, actually met in person. And so uh, it's, uh, it's going to be an interesting study and, I, and I, I'll just take a, a quick moment here to thank all of you for, for, for just, I think many of you believe that I've uh, I've helped you somewhat you know, over the years. You need to know just how much you've helped me. Uh, it's uh, iron sharpens iron. So it's, it's not uh, that I've just helped you, but you've, you continue to help me. You encourage me. You, 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 you strengthen me. You comfort me uh, in ways that uh, I couldn't even begin to describe.
I think personally, I think you've done a whole lot more. You folks have done a whole lot more for me than what I've done for you. Uh, there's just no, no way that I can, I can adequately describe uh, just what you all mean to me. And I think we're going to see that as well as we go into this epistle. God's heart toward his people, uh, his, his heart, their heart toward him. And so Paul, the apostle Paul, called an apostle. He sent one, a, a messenger, uh, uh, a preacher. Uh, now, I'm not going to get into the debate as to whether the question uh, is, I'm not interested in, in really spending a whole lot of time discussing, you know, the, the argument, the, you know, over whether there are apostles today or not. Uh, you know, uh, many, I've had many Christians tell me that they were apostles. Uh, it seems as if that you're in a, in a position, if you're in a position of teaching or preaching, that, that you may consider yourself a, an apostle. Maybe God still does uh, uh, work through apostles today. Uh, I, I'm not sure how I would answer that. Uh, I don't consider, I can tell you I don't consider myself an apostle. Uh, I consider myself a teacher. But in strictly looking at Paul being an apostle uh, of Jesus Christ, it was through the will of God that he became an apostle. And I believe that the first verse uh, at least gives us, at least it gives me the impression, not only was he a will, uh, a, an apostle by the will of God, not his own will, but that the writing of the letter to the Corinthians was through the will of God, not the will of Paul. And of course, Sosthenes, uh, our brother, there's not much said about Sosthenes. I don't think he's mentioned uh, after this. Uh, um, you can take the, the position that he's the one that actually wrote the letter, uh, that, you know, it was his hand that wrote the letter uh, for Paul. Uh, and so that's why he's mentioned, but we don't know anything else about Sosthenes, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about Sosthenes. But it, it is unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, uh, to them that are sanctified, and automatically Christians all over the world will read that verse and say, well, maybe I'm not sanctified in Christ Jesus. I'm certainly uh, not sure if I'm called a saint. Uh, and I think that we're not allowed to do that given the rest of the verse, the rest of verse two, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. If there's anything that verse two says, okay, to us, it is that we have been sanctified in Christ Jesus and called saints. Uh, we haven't even begun to touch on grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, which is, there. those words, folks, are, I think, m far too often glossed over if we really slow down, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, we might begin to, to get a sense of just where we stand as believers before God. It's hard to read grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ and, and come away from that believing that, well, for, for whatever reason, uh, we don't have God's grace and we don't have God's pre peace uh, uh, from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's because, and I, and I think that is just primarily the problem, is Christians will read this and, 
as if this were, and this is I think one reason why they love to spend so much time in the Gospels, the red lettered words of Jesus. They're more comfortable in that historical, earthly, natural setting than they are Paul's epistles, which carries you over into the spiritual realm of everything. And they don't have any understanding, many don't, of the nature of this transition that occurred uh, from when Christ was here in a, an earthly body. And he was preaching an earthly kingdom to an earthly people. And uh, both the king as well as Israel's king as well as the message of the kingdom was rejected. And therefore God turned his attention to the Gentiles. Uh, now enter Paul. Uh, uh, Israel was set aside in unbelief. And now we're looking at the dispensation of grace, which God had planned beforehand. And that's the age in which we're living. And we, we just, we are so earthbound and, and uh, sort of bound to our emotions earthwise and natural wise that we tend to, to think that when we come over and read these epistles of Paul's, this is just really, this is really nice stuff, and it's spiritual. It's not earthly, but it's kind of reserved for the select few. You know, those who are really good Christians, I mean, those are the ones, okay, that are sanctified. Those are the ones that are saints. Those are the ones that really even just have the right to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ yeah, I certainly don't feel qualified. I certainly don't feel uh, deserving of God's grace. Folks, the very nature of God's grace is that we don't deserve it. And so, right from the very beginning, as we just begin our study, we see that we have been, just, just as with the Corinthians, okay, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. We are included and we have been sanctified. Sanctified. The word means set apart. I pointed this out in previous studies. We're going to go through uh, uh, these verses and we're going to look at this in, in more detail. The I think it's time to study. We've, we've read through it. Uh, I would suggest reading through it seven or eight times before you begin studying it. And then, and now it's study time, at least for me. And uh, so the first thing I'm interested in really is the background. You know, uh, uh, that's uh, information is readily available. It's, it's easily accessible. It's the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. It's, it was probably written about 53, 54 uh, AD at Ephesus. Uh, it deals with problems that arose in the early years after Paul's initial missionary visit, as I mentioned, uh, which was just several years before, two or three years before, prior to that, uh, to his visit uh, to them at Corinth and, and his establishment there of a church at Corinth, which I believe is an organism, a living organism, not a, a brick and mortar structure, even though they met in synagogues. I think there were many churches in Corinth, or at least several. Uh, and I have good reason to believe that because usually there are uh, uh, it would just, given the historical nature of the, of the uh, evolving of the church uh, over time, it, it's not long. It's it's not very long at all before someone's off starting their a new church, and uh, uh, we break off into different factions and divisions. There's there's divisions among us. Uh, I'm not. I've never believed that there was just one single church in Corinth that Paul was writing to. He's writing to every single believer in Corinth who was a member of the body of Christ, which encompassed, uh, well, maybe you understand what I'm saying. Uh, 
it, it was comprised of the entire body of Christ at Corinth. It didn't matter whether they were going to this church, that church, in church, out of church. It doesn't matter. It's God's people. And, uh, and so it's good to have a little bit of a, of a, of a background. Uh, as we go forward, context, as I've pointed out before, context, 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 it's important. We, we really need to look at things in context because there's always an immediate context as well as an overall context. And so we, we don't want to ignore that as we go along. Now, me, myself, as I, as I go through this, the, uh, after I've read it in the English, uh, the King James primarily, because that's the version that I'm, I'm so used to, and I've memorized so many verses from the King James, I'll, I'll look at some of the other translations and see how that they, they present this, uh, write out this verse uh, or that verse. And, but one of the things that is important to me is that I, is that, and it should be to all of us, is that we define terms, okay? So we want to, as we go through this, we want to look at word meanings. And in the text, there are many words that we could misconstrue the meaning of. And so it's important that we really become accustomed to understanding word meanings. The next thing would be the grammar. And you don't have to be a New Testament Greek scholar to look at the grammar. The tools out there are available. You can look at it, uh, at the grammar, and the grammar itself, uh, all the tools that are available will help you understand uh, what you're looking at. Now, I understand that grammar encompasses a lot. Uh, primarily, we're looking at, uh, at the different word forms. We're looking at uh, one of my... Uh, on personal, uh, one of the per the things that I look at uh, more, uh, I think, probably than anything else, is personal pronouns. It's it's important to take note of who he's talking to, uh, of the personal pronouns that's mentioned, and to look, you know, and make make that right distinction between what is singular, what is plural. Uh, we obviously we want to be looking at the action verbs and we want to be looking at uh, the grammar to see if this is a command and if, if, if it's if it's an imperative mood if it's a perfect tense present tense you know that sort of thing the tense the mood uh, there's there's many aspects of the grammar that we can become accustomed to that we can adopt into our our method of bible study that will help us tremendously because you've got to keep in mind that any translation, and that includes the King James, is just that. It's a translation. It is not the original text. It was translated from the original text. And so word meanings, grammar are important. So is cross-referencing. Uh, usually by the time we uh, become accustomed to studying in this fashion, we were already familiar with a number of other passages and verses. And uh, so we cross-reference. Whether we do that by memory or with the, stel with the help of study aids, it's good to cross-reference. Not only does that give us a, a more of a confirmation uh, of our interpretation being correct, but it also really opens up a window of, of, of light into our, our present study when we cross-reference. You can also spend time looking at the commentaries. That is one thing that I try to avoid unless absolutely unless it's absolutely necessary. And the reason for that is because I don't want my my interpretation, my ideas of, of, of uh, that I get from a passage of scripture, I don't want it, my judgment to be clouded or I don't want it to be prejudiced by other people's conclusions before I've reached mine. It's it's kind of, you know, I want to I want to see it for myself first. I want to understand what I believe this is saying first. Then it's okay for me to now go and look at others' opinions. And there's where we are given options. You know, well, we've got 
we can see we have a number of options, three, maybe four or five, however many options of, of others on how that they interpret this. And that, that can help us in a, in a very big way. So there's just a few of the things that I think about as, as I begin any study through Scripture. Now, there's a few other things that we know from the city of Corinth uh, that we know from history and some of the, the writers of history. We know that, that the Romans wanted to make sure that, that uh, Greece had no power left, and so they totally destroyed uh, the city and, and they laid it uh, bare. It was uh, absolutely desolate until the days of Julius Caesar. Uh, and uh, Caesar, although he was, uh, uh, he, even though it was still a Roman city, he, he really felt the need to restore it, to rebuild it. Uh, it ought to be rebuilt because of the commerce and, and you know, uh, the, the, the the traveling routes you know that had to do a lot of it had to do with commerce and so really the, the the city of Corinth was rebuilt and it was established as one of the most prosperous uh, cities and uh, I think it's important to realize this because from a, a from a purely historical standpoint uh, the uh, at, at, by the time that we actually come to the, our epistle, uh, we see that it was a very, very prosperous city. There are things that happen with uh, prosperity when you have to use every minute of every day to feed your family and support your family and just to make ends meet. And, uh, and so, you know, we we're even actually we're familiar with that that entire concept even today in, in the modern era and uh and with the establishment and the rebuilding of cities and the and commerce and and all that and prosperity and and corinth became a very very prosperous city and uh so therefore as a result of that it became a very licentious city and it's, uh, I think most of you know, uh, that to use the expression to, uh, to Corinthicize uh, meant that you, you used the, back then you used the services of prostitutes. Uh, you know, in the old city, the uh, uh, temple of, of Venus, it had over a thousand women, you know, that, who were free to anybody who would offer money in the offering so uh, you know i think it sort of worked as to ease the conscience of those you know that, that were involved in in this temple worship you know they felt like they were rather than doing something wrong they were doing a good thing by supporting you know the, the temple through offerings but uh, one of the perks was that you know you had access to a lot of prostitution and so, you know, and the way that they lived in that city was really bad. And, you know, you th if you think Las Vegas is bad, well, Corinth was worse. And, uh, and so now God's ordained Paul to write a letter to the Corinthians. And, I, you know, I've often thought, you know, if I had been a Christian back then, I would have wrote something a little different than what Paul wrote. You know, I would have lambasted them for all of the, you know, immoral activities that they were involved in and, and all of that and I guess I'm really not keeping this part of this historical aspect uh, out of the discussion here because I didn't really want to bring that in too heavily until we had actually studied into the epistle uh, but we do know that from the outset you know, and I suppose there's nothing wrong with with uh, proceeding uh, right from the very beginning based upon that outset but if we were not to if we didn't know that uh, I don't. Th I'm not sure that these verses would have the same impact. But uh, if we were reading First Corinthians for the first time and we didn't know that, uh, I think the effect 
on us. It would be less, a little less dramatic. It's a little more dramatic when we realize that God the Holy Spirit, through, through the Apostle Paul, and the help that he had in uh, writing and distributing these letters. When he, when he sent this letter to Tim, with Timothy to the first ch uh, the church at, at Corinth, uh, that uh, he had, uh, that we're looking at God the Holy Spirit, and you've heard me mention this many, many times. We're not looking at the logic of Paul, the thinking of Paul, the emotion of Paul, the, the rational uh, thoughts of Paul. We're not looking at the life of Paul, you know, how good a Christian Paul was or how good or bad a Christian that they were. Folks, look, uh, please listen. I, I have no doubt that many of you out there are involved in activities of the flesh, uh, uh, just as all Christians are. But it does not negate the fact. It's, it does not change or alter the fact of how God himself views his people, his children, and, and how that he speaks to his children. There is, you see nothing in the text, dearly beloved, nothing here that would indicate that God has somewhat against the church at Corinth. Now, we just got through coming out of a study in, in 1 John, beautiful uh, study in 1 John, where that we saw, uh, among many other things, one of the primary things that we, we came to realize through that study is, is that uh, there is a distinction to be made between the flesh and the spirit, between the old man and the new man, between law and grace, between uh, the flesh and the spirit, uh, and that God does not uh, weigh or evaluate our, our relationship with him or determine the, the condition of our relationship with him based upon the carnality uh, of the flesh, uh, the old man. Yes, there were believers at Corinth, uh, without, without question. They were God's people who were involved in all types, all types of, of activity that, that even ourselves today, even we would, uh, would tend to look at, we would off, we rightly, we, you know, would look at as, as activities that, that we ourselves wouldn't, would not want to be involved in. Uh, but because, and this is the point I want to make, because Corinth was restored, uh, to a city of, of great prosperity uh, there often comes with that prosperity uh, licentiousness uh, it's one thing to to serve the Lord when you're poor it's another thing to serve the Lord when you're rich it's it's you know most people want to be rich they don't want to be poor I think it's important to understand you know that it's a little harder for those Christians I think uh, who who do have money, who are wealthy, who are not poor, it's, it may be a little more of a challenge to them to not be as, uh, as licentious in their lives as those who are poor. Uh, but whether we are, whether we're not, whether we're one of these so-called good Christians or whether we're, you know, not so good a Christian, at least from the human standpoint, the, 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 the stark reality of this is, is that God the Holy Spirit, uh, through the, the Apostle Paul, is wanting these believers to know right from the beginning, right from the outset, where he stands in relationship to them. We, we tend to worry about where do we stand in our relationship to God? Where, where, where do we stand? You know, how does God look at us? How does he view us? How does make me personally? my own personal life and when we ask that question it's often asked from the standpoint of of a belief a, a, a wrong belief in god's relationship with us where that we wrongly falsely assume that god evaluates our our 
our relationship with him, the quality of our relationship with him. He does that based upon our performance. And that is what we're not seeing here. And that is what we will not see uh, in these 16 chapters that follow. Uh, the 16 chapters of Corinthians. You're never going to see this once. You're never going to see, there's, there's not in 16 chapters, not one verse, not one, where that God is imploring, commanding, encouraging, exhorting these believers at Corinth who are, whose lives are basically a, a mess from the physical, fleshly standpoint to clean up the old man to clean up their lives, to get their lives on track, to get to, to straighten up their lives so that then they will then qualify or they will then uh, well, just be all that they can be, you know, for the Lord. Grace targets such ones as these, dearly beloved. And many of us are, even though we may not be involved in the uh, activities in which the, the Corinthians were, sin is sin. And God, as I've pointed out in so many videos, God has nothing against you, dearly beloved. He knows the paths that you take. He says, after he's tested us, we shall come forth as gold. He loves us with an, a love that is everlasting, that is so incomprehensible that we couldn't, there's no man that's ever lived that has been able to adequately describe the love of God that he has for us. I love you all, I truly do. I hope that you'll find this study bless, a blessing as we go forward and we, through these 16 chapters, I don't know how long that'll take, but Lord willing, uh, we will be honest with the text, uh, even if it goes against uh, mainstream thought. Until next time, rest in Him. And thanks for watching.